Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. Welcome to my kitchen. I'm happy to have you here with me today where we are going to make two recipes out of a cookbook from 1910. This cookbook was sent to me by Terry. Thank you so much, Terry. When I opened it up, I actually gasped because the cookbook is so beautiful and the recipes in it are so absolutely wonderful. So thank you very much for that. One of the reasons I love cooking out of antique cookbooks is not only are they beautiful and they're filled with such fun and interesting little glimpses into the past, but also because the recipes are written in a way that is very familiar to me. It is a way that I just sort of naturally cook which I love. It's very different than modern cookbooks that use fancier ingredients. Uh, they're just very simple and I really enjoy that. I don't know about you, but cooking in the kitchen can become kind of a tedious task over time. And cooking out of these old cookbooks has helped to inspire me, uh, kind of excite me to be in the kitchen again. And this cookbook is definitely no exception. Let me show you. Look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? And it's in such fabulous condition. So let me read you a part of Terry's letter. Okay, so this says, Dear Chelsea, this little cookbook belonged to my husband's step-grandmother, Gladys Arnold. You could see her name inscribed in the front of the book. She was born in Ohio in 1898 and died in 1985. She must have ordered this book when she was quite young, long before she married my husband's grandfather in 1925. The book was given to me by my mother-in-law when she reached the point of downsizing, which is where Terry's at in her life now, and she thought that I would appreciate this cookbook, and I most certainly do. One of the things that I like to do with my old cookbooks is actually use them. And of course, a kitchen is a messy, greasy, dirty place when you're in the middle of cooking, at least anyway. And the chance of there being splashes or anything like that hitting the cover of this cookbook, it freaks me out. So I am going to be very careful when I'm using this cookbook. And like with all my antique cookbooks, I keep them away on a shelf when they're not in use but it feels kind of a shame to just have this sitting on a shelf and not actually being used as well. So this book was published by Wash, the Washburn Crosby Company. And this company was taken over, I think in around 1927 by General Mills, but gold metal flour is actually still around today. One of the neat things about this cookbook is I have quite a few cookbooks that were put out by companies and all the recipes in the cookbooks generally call for the whatever the ingredient or whatever the product is that they're selling of course but this one is actually not like that there's a lot of recipes in here that don't call for flour at all there's ice cream recipes in here and uh, jelly recipes okay so this one is for calf foot jelly four calf feet four quarts of cold water, a half a box of gelatin, one cup of sugar, two lemons, two inch stick of cinnamon, three eggs, and one pint of wine. <laughs> so I, I don't know about you, but that does not sound incredibly appetizing. But my husband, I was reading this cookbook this morning over tea and Dan pointed out that they just didn't have anything go to waste and there wasn't any convenience foods. So they really did utilize, uh, as many different ingredients as was possible. So if you were going to butcher an animal, you were going to use every part of it, which I definitely can get behind. Although I'm not really sure if calf foot jelly sounds overly appealing though, does it? And this, isn't that beautiful? This is the, a good bread recipe and it's written as a poem with all of the instructions along the side as well. So I thought this would be the perfect recipe for us to start with. And then the other thing that we're going to make out of here is pickled eggs. And I have only done pickled eggs a couple of times before, but this one sounded really good. You actually stuff garlic into the eggs when you're pickling it. And I absolutely love pickled garlic. So I think that these are going to be really good. There was one small section that I wanted to read to you here because this just cracked me up. So it's talking specifically about white bread. It wasn't until the, during the second world war, I believe, where the government's put in a lot of push to be using all of the parts of the flour. So making a heavier, denser flour because it was more economical and there wasn't the waste of getting rid of the bran 
out of the flour. So actually white bread was something that was, as flour was being refined in a larger way, in larger um, mills, was to have white flour. And that was considered actually a much healthier option than whole wheat flour which I find really fascinating. So this says, most of us accept bread in the much the same spirit as we breathe without any thought as to the good it does us or what we would do if it were ever taken away. However, since people eat bread 365 days in a year and many of them three times a day, we wish to say something about its great value as a life sustainer. As a matter of fact, white bread made from gold metal flour is more nearly a perfect food and will sustain life much longer than any other single ration because its tissue forming constituents and its energy yielding portion are more nearly in the exact same proportions demanded by the human system. So if you've ever been concerned about eating too much bread or carbs, fear not, it's perfect. It's just perfection and it's exactly what your body needs. Oh my gosh, this is so good. The United States government has made many experiments to determine the actual value of different food rations. In one case, for example, a student, age 23, was fed on white bread and milk for a space of two days, gaining two pounds in weight in that time. He consumed one, to one nine tenths pounds of bread and four three quarters pounds of milk per day. Numerous experiments always yield approximately the same results and show that white bread has the digestibility value of 97%. The following table computed from figures given in bulletin number 142, United States Department of Agriculture illustrates the comparative amounts of nutritional value in white flour and some more common foods. And I'll put that up on the screen here. So if you were ever in doubt about the nutritional value of white bread, doubt no more my friends, it is the perfect food according to these guys. So that is why I decided that today we were going to start with the white bread recipe because it's a perfect food and I, I wholeheartedly agree. I do love myself a nice thick slice of warm white bread with butter. So we're going to start with this because there is a lot of rising time involved in this recipe. I'm going to follow it exactly as it says. The only thing that I'm going to be changing is I will be using regular active dry yeast rather than yeast cakes because I don't have access to yeast cakes and that's what it calls for. But fortunately, it does tell me um, that in this case, it calls for two cakes of yeast, and but it says each cake is a half an ounce of yeast. So I'll be able to weigh that out. When I was looking online to try to find what a cake of yeast would be equivalent to today, I wasn't able to actually find what it would be in 1910 because a cake of yeast changed in weights over the years. But thankfully, it does tell me right there how many ounces. So we're gonna start with that. Um, over on the stove here, I do have a beet that's cooking down because I need a um, one cooked beet for the pickled eggs that we're going to make. So in case you were wondering what's cooking on the stove over there, that's what it is. Decided that for an even more authentic experience for myself, I would cook right beside my wood cook stove, which is what women in 1910 would have done. And we are still where the weather is fairly chilly outside, so I'm able to have the stove without completely overheating the house. But I can imagine what it would have been like to have had to cook in the summertime and having this be your only option. Would have been warm, my friends. It's very, very hot. This says, first mix a lukewarm quart, my daughter. One half scalded milk, one half water. To this, please add two cakes of yeast or the liquid kind if prefer preferred in the least. So I am going to scald a half a quart of milk. And one thing I do love about this is if you have my cookbook, you know that I do use quart measurements in quite a few of my recipes. So that's what I mean. That's one of the things I love about these cookbooks is they measure the way that I do. So that's around half a quart. Once we see some little bubbles around the edge of this, that means our milk is scalded. I am going to go get some cold water, a half a quart of cold water to add to this to cool it down so that we don't kill our yeast. While we're at it, let's check our beet here. I'd say that's cooked enough. If you're not familiar with a wood cook stove, the firebox is right here. So these elements, these two elements here are generally what I use to boil things on, fry things on. But if I want to simmer something, I'll put it over on this side because it's much cooler over here. The further away I go from the wood box, of course, the cooler it is. So I usually keep a kettle of water 
on this side of the stove. You can see how nice and hot it is to be able to uh, pour myself a cup of tea, but also just for the steam to be able to keep the air a little bit more moist because wood heat does dry the air out a lot. So where are we at with that? Okay, we're just at the point where we're starting to see some bubbles around the edge. So we're going to add our scalded milk to our bowl. And to this, we are going to add half a quart of cold milk, or sorry, cold water. So that is still a little bit too warm to add the yeast to. So I'm just going to set this in a sink full of cold water to cool it off a little faster. And while we're doing this, we will measure out our yeast. Okay, there we go. We have our one ounce of yeast. Next, stir in a teaspoonful of nice clear salt. If the bread isn't good, it won't be our fault. Now add the sugar, tablespoons three, mix well together for dissolved they must be. So we're going to add our yeast. One, two, and three. And I have never in bread making added salt at this point, but I'm following these steps exactly. Teaspoon of salt. Next, pour the whole mixture into an earthenware bowl. A pan is just as good if it hasn't a hole. It's the cook and the flour, not the bowl or the pan, that makes the bread that makes the man. <laughs> Oh, this is just fantastic. Now let the mixture stand a minute or two. You have other things of great importance to do. First, sift the flour. Use the finest in the land. Three quarts is the measure. Gold metal is the brand. So we are not using gold metal, although that would have been fantastic if I had been able to access that, but we are going to use some organic white flour here. So we need three quarts of flour. I'm going to grab a fresh quart jar that's dry. And I never sift flour, but again, for the sake of the recipe, I shall do so today. Okay, so we are going to sift our flour. Try not to make a big powdery mess. And it does say here that some people like a little shortening power. If this is your choice, just add to the flour. Two tablespoons of lard and jumble about till the flour and lard are mixed without doubt. So I am going to add a couple tablespoons of our lard. And then we'll give this a good mix. You basically just want to mix this until the uh, lard is mixed in fully and it's kind of the same texture as it would be for like a baking powder biscuit or something like that where it's just kind of like fine oatmeal. All right, we do have our beautiful foamy yeast here, our sifted flour mixed in with our lard and now we are going to mix these two together. Let's make sure we do it the right way. Next, stir the flour into the mixture that stood, waiting to play its part to make the bread good. Mix it up thoroughly, but not too thick. Some flours make bread that's more like a brick. So we are going to mix this in. It is possible that I don't need all of this flour. The amount of flour that you need to add to a recipe really depends upon the flour that you're using, the amount of humidity in the air, and other factors as well. So we'll see how much of this we actually need. And when mixing flour into liquid, give it a minute before you add more because it will absorb a lot of the water and thicken up a bit as it gets mixed in and as it sits. So now we'll cover up our dough and set it over not too close, but close enough that it's nice and warm. And then we'll go get onto our pickled eggs. Okay, so this is kind of funny. Remember how I said that this was kind of a cool recipe because it called for garlic. 
stuffed in the egg. <laughs> no, it calls for cloves. So because it says 24 whole cloves, I read whole cloves as garlic, but no, no, no. It means cloves as in the spice cloves. I actually don't like cloves at all. So I am going to actually put my garlic in with these eggs and make garlic pickled eggs. So I will be altering this recipe a little bit, but the actual brine itself will be exactly as it calls for. So for the brine, it calls for two cups of vinegar, the one small cooked beet, which we already have cooked, one stick of cinnamon, a quarter bay leaf, a half a teaspoon of salt, a half a teaspoon of pepper, and a half a teaspoon of mustard. And then it says stick four cloves in each egg. <sighs> cloves, cloves. So if you like cloves, use cloves. I am actually just going to put my garlic right into my jar with my pickled eggs. So I am actually just going to, because I have peeled garlic cloves here. I am actually just going to add some of these garlic cloves in with, um, in with the eggs so that I can have garlic pickled eggs and also the pickled garlic as well, which I love as I mentioned before. <laughs> so the first thing that we're going to do is peel our eggs. So I did boil these eggs on the cook stove for eight minutes and then put them in cold water. So these are fresh eggs. These are actually yesterday's eggs and generally really fresh eggs don't peel well. So the way that I find to do eggs is I actually boil mine. I've tried all the methods, the steaming method, using the um, instant pot, all of that. I just boil them for eight minutes and then I make sure that they sit in cold water for at least a half an hour and then I keep replenishing the water so that the eggs themselves are um, nice and cold. So you do want to have your eggs that are going to be for making pickled eggs as unblemished as possible. So where they don't have spots that are open like that. It's not the end of the world if they do, but it's better if they don't. So if you are going to do this, make sure that you uh, do a few extra eggs than the recipe calls for. So that way, if a couple of them don't end up healing nicely, which always happens, you can just eat those and use your ones that have peeled really nicely for your pickled eggs. I am going to do a half gallon of these, but the recipe itself with the six eggs fits really nicely into a quart jar. And the whole point of the beet is just to add color to your pickled eggs. Give them a little bit of a pink color. So if you don't want that, you don't have to add the beet. One of the other things you can do, this one is the shell is stuck on there pretty good. So I'm actually going to go run this under water while I'm peeling it. And sometimes that helps to get the shell off a little bit easier. Not perfect, but good enough. Okay, so now it says to take all of our seasonings and moisten with a little bit of cold vinegar, just enough to moisten them all. So we're going to add a teaspoon of pepper. Hi, I'm having fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. Quarter teaspoon of bay leaf. We need a half a teaspoon of mustard, a stick of cinnamon, which I do not have. So I'll be adding a little bit of cinnamon, about half a teaspoon or so, and a teaspoon of salt, enough vinegar to moisten. Beet right here, and it calls for half of a cooked beet, so I'm gonna be using a whole one. And we need four cups of vinegar. So we heat this to the boiling point, add the spices slowly, and boil for a minute.
look at our beautiful bread dough. I'd say that's just about ready. Let's see if we have to add some more wood. A little bit more wouldn't hurt. As soon as it's light, place again on the board. Knead it well this time. Here's the knowledge to hoard. Now back in the bowl once more it must go and set it again to rise for an hour or so. This looks good to me, nice and sproiny. One of the issues with over kneading bread is that you can end up with a tough bread, not like a nice light fluffy bread, but this actually looks really nice. So in this book, it talks about why you need the bread at this point and it has to do with redistributing the yeast throughout the bread. This is what this book says anyway, uh, so that it can access more of the sugars that are in there and make it nice and light and fluffy. Also to remove any large air bubbles that might be in your bread so that you don't have holes in your bread and you have nice even air distributed throughout your bread. Okay, so now we're going to add our spices. We need to get a different spoon into our vinegar. And then it just says to boil for a minute. All right, so I am going to put a few of these garlic cloves in the bottom of here and place my eggs in the jar. Add a couple more cloves of garlic, and then we'll add our brine on top of this. So I think I'm going to do hard boil six more eggs and add six more eggs to this because I might as well fill it right up. All right, friends, I fit six more eggs in our jar. Don't those look beautiful? So I'm gonna put those in the fridge and we'll try them in a couple of weeks. Our bread dough is ready. So now it says to form the dough gently into loaves when light and place it in bread pans greased just right. So I have oiled four bread pans. I thought it was going to make three when I originally mixed it up, but now I think we're gonna get four loaves out of this. Okay, and place in bread pans grease just right. Shape each loaf to make to half fill the pan. This bread will be good enough for any young man. Next, let rise to the level of the pans no more. Have the temperature right, don't set near the door. Be very careful about drafts, it isn't meant to freeze. Keep the room good and warm, say 72 degrees. I'm actually going to move these over by the stove where it's a little bit warmer and uh, we're gonna let them sit until they have risen till they're just at the level of our bread pans. And I'm just gonna pop these into the fridge.
one of the things about cooking in a wood cook stove is like I explained before, most of the heat is coming from the wood box over here, or it is all coming from the wood box over here, but it kind of moves around and up over here and out the chimney. So this side of the oven is much hotter than this side. So usually around every 15 minutes or so, I need to move everything around so that it browns evenly. So now it says, oh, hang on, let me grab the cookbook. Now put in the oven, it's ready to bake. Keep uniform fire, great results are at stake. One hour more of waiting and you'll be repaid by bread that is worthy of a well-bred maid. So we'll see if I'm a well-bred maid or not by the end of this. Can you see in there? We have brown there. Getting quite brown on that one. What we're looking for now is a nice hollow knocking sound, and we have that. All right, let's give our 1910 bread a try. soft. All right, let's give it a try. I will definitely be making that again. <clears throat> Excuse me, I think the only thing that I would do differently is make the three loaves instead of four loaves, just so that the loaves were just a little bit bigger, but this is a good sandwich size of loaf. It's so good, my kids are gonna like that. Let me show you what I was doing while the bread was baking. I choked on a little piece of the bread because I was just eating it so enthusiastically. <laughs> so if I sound like I have a frog in my throat now, that's the reason why. But I wanted to show you that I got the rest of my tomatoes started and the rest of my peppers. I also started some artichokes, which I should have started back in February. But I just saw the seeds at the feed store the other day and decided I would start a few and see. It's supposed to be a really hot summer this year, so if we get enough heat, I might be able to grow them. Uh, I'll put them down in the high tunnel though. That was so much fun. Thank you so much, Terry, for this amazing cookbook. I will cherish it always. I hope that you enjoyed today's video, everyone, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye.